Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are and at what time you decide to tune into this episode. I'm Rahul Gosain, here as always, sharing the mic with my brother and your co-host, Rohit Gosain. On our podcast, The Oncology Brothers, today we're back with the challenging case series where we focus on real-life scenarios and apply the data in hand. This time, we're focusing on EGFR-positive non-small cell lung cancer. We thankfully now have few options in frontline, which is making these discussions with our patients a bit more complicated. But this is a good problem to have as our patients are living longer with these interventions. But these treatments are with palliative intent. To walk us through our initial treatment options and what next if the disease was to progress, we're excited to welcome back Dr. Eric Senge, a thoracic medical oncologist from MD Anderson and honorary third brother. Eric, it's always a pleasure to have you. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here and to join you both. Eric, as Rahul mentioned, we have three options for a common EGFR mutation in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer cases. That is osimertinib, amivantamab plus lazertinib based off of Mariposa trial. And then osimertinib plus chemo off of Flora 2. Osimertinib by itself is an option, but for a very small subset now, especially when we have overall survival data with the two combination therapies. Focusing on our first case here, we have a 58-year-old gentleman with metastatic disease with CNS involvement, but overall asymptomatic from that standpoint. Tissue NGS did confirm EGFR19 deletion. Given strong data with MELAS for CNS involvement, patient was started on this combination based off of Mariposa. Actually, Eric, can you just start us off here? What data do we have for MELAS upfront now? Is that what you go to is with responsiveness here? Yeah, the data to support amylase up front comes from the Mariposa study, which you highlighted very nicely. Phase three study, where essentially they compared amylase versus single agent osimertinib. And initially we got the FDA approval based on a median progression-free survival benefit. We just heard earlier this year that there is an overall survival benefit. It's helping patients live longer, which we consider to be a gold standard in terms of efficacy endpoints for our patients with cancer. I think for this particular case, there's a lot to consider. One of them, which you highlighted is the disease burden. And so this patient has multiple brain metastases, thankfully is asymptomatic from a neurological standpoint, but also has other high-risk disease sites like visceral disease in the liver. So I've already got my red flag up about this patient. I'm already thinking about combination therapy for that reason. So thinking about CNS metastases for most of these patients, first off, I'm talking with my multidisciplinary colleagues about if we're going to need to use radiation or local therapy to make sure we're managing that because as you know, CNS disease control is really a priority, especially with de novo intracranial disease. So that's one thing I'm thinking about. In terms of unpacking the data from Mariposa, what I appreciate about that study is that we got very robust data about how that combination strategy is doing with regards to the brain because serial brain MRIs were mandated for all participants in that study. So you had to have a brain MRI every eight weeks for the first three years, followed by every 12 weeks subsequently. We have very robust data about intracranial progression-free survival. At the 36-month mark, 36% of patients still had intracranial progression-free survival if they were on that combination strategy, which is double, so 18% if you're on osimertinib alone, which I think is really impactful and really makes me think about using a combination regimen if patients are coming with de novo intracranial disease. Eric, thanks for touching on that. Anytime we're talking about amylase, one thing to keep in mind in our clinical practice ends up being that supportive care management that needs to be at the forefront to decrease infusion reactions, cocoon data to decrease the risk of VTE and skin toxicities. The other thing now that we're talking about combination trials, our patients are living longer, but there's another added toxicity here, time toxicity. We're bringing in these patients, be it for chemotherapy or amivantamab versus osimertinib and off you go. So we have to keep that in mind. We're eagerly waiting on sub-Q formulation. Hopefully that's gonna make things a lot quicker Eric, we're chit-chatting. You have a clinical trial for that on your end, but hopefully once this is available, this will be widely used in clinical practice as well. Eric, coming back to this patient, can we take a few minutes to understand the dosing schedule and the need for dose interruption if we run into side effects? And if we do this, are we compromising any outcomes? These are all great questions. My strategy when I'm prescribing amivantamab plus azartinib is to not only prescribe that therapeutic regimen, but you absolutely have to lean into the supportive regimen. So you highlighted the importance of skipper and cocoon. What we got out of the data with regards to PFS benefit and OS benefit was what I call Mariposa 1.0. Those patients didn't have 
all the supportive measures that were routinely baked in and embedded and need to truly be prescribed for patients right now in clinics. I would argue that their quality of life is hopefully better, that we're helping with supportive care for leaning into those strategies more frequently for those patients and trying to keep them onto therapy longer. That being said, what we know from our APOSA, when they looked to see what the median progression-free survival was, if patients stayed on for four months of exposure in the beginning, even with dose interruptions, it was actually very similar between patients that had dose interruptions or did not. So the PFS rates were just above 50%, I think 52% two years out. And so that provides some reassurance that if you need a dose interruption, which the majority of patients did on Moraposa, you aren't compromising that progression-free survival benefit. I'm still waiting to see more information about dose reductions, obviously not only a compromise of progression-free survival, but overall survival. I think all of that is still pending, but more data we can get to support people make patients feel comfortable that quality of life and supportive measures need to be a priority just as much as staying on therapy. I'm eager for it. Right. Again, just to clarify some of the missing points that we've not touched on, Rahul, let's make sure that we do put in that slide from this year's ELCC 2025 covering all those points. I do have that printed out. Yes, I do use that in my clinic regularly. I do too. I love that slide. Absolutely. Summarizes things very well. Yeah. Eric, when talking about skin toxicity, we see grade two rash, which can be seen with amivantamab as well as lazertinib. How do you decide which one of these is causing that? Do you stop both? Do you dose reduce, skip a dose, or go after one over the other? Yeah. So this is a really good question. It's tough. And I'm often working with a multidisciplinary colleague in dermatology if we're getting up to grade two or grade three adverse events from a dermatologic standpoint. First, you wanna make sure that they are truly adherent and they understand the full cocoon regimen. Not everyone is used to a huge skincare routine. Maybe Rahul, I don't know, you're using a very (laughs) adherent skincare routine, but not everyone's used to it. He's pretty good with it. You have to make sure patients are adherent to it, that they understand the buy-in is there. You need a motivated patient. You wanna make sure that sun protection is still heavily emphasized because a lot of us forget about that. We're sometimes so focused on the regimen and making sure your pharmacist and your APP, everyone's like teaching them about that, that you forget at the basics. So I think make sure those are there, make sure you're talking to dermatology. And if a patient is still having adverse events, typically I give the benefit of the doubt for the lazertinib and I react with the amivantamab first. I'm making my tweaks for modifications to the amivantamab, trying to keep them on the full dose lazertinib. What do I do in terms of how I'm tweaking amivantamab? Often we'll do a dose interruption. And if the dose interruption helps to clear things, when we reintroduce amivantamab, I typically do it at a lower dose, a one level dose reduction, and then keep them on the lizardinib and watch very closely, still trying to make sure I'm optimizing their buy-in for Cocoon, that the dermatologist hasn't thought of something else. I know Cocoon 2.0 is also cooking and brewing. So more things, more reiterations are coming to help our patients. And a quick shout out to Jill Feldman, who was leading some of the efforts from Cocoon as well. These are exciting times and our patients are indeed living longer from these interventions. For Mariposa, median overall survival was not reached yet at roughly 42 months. So very likely, we're going to see more than four years of overall survival here. And for Flora 2, we also have overall survival data. But again, these interventions are with palliative intent. So we have to think about sequence. What next? This is a good segue to our second patient, where we have a 66-year-old woman with progressive disease while on osomertineb and pemetrexate after initial FLORA2 regimen. Eric, what next here? For this patient who got chemo ASE, and what about that patient who has progressive disease on amylazaphon? Can you walk us through our treatment options here and the importance of repeat NGS? Yeah, before we even get into that, I was looking at the pack year smoking history, greater than 100 years, right? And you still found an actual genomic alteration, EGFR classical mutation. So I think this is just an opportunity to take a step back and say, Give your patients the benefit of the doubt if they have non-small cell lung cancer, it's advanced stage, don't be biased because they have a smoking history. You can find a mutation. So that's what happened in this case. Even the case before, that patient also had a smoking history. So I think that's one thing to call out. Now, let's say you start off with a combination regimen. What are you doing if, unfortunately, your patients experience disease progression? One of the things I'll highlight is that in both trials, we still lost about 26 to 31% of patients being able to get their first line of subsequent therapy after that combination strategy. And remember, these are really fit patients. Many of them are young. They had to have had a PS of zero to one. So imagine in the real world setting, we're losing even more patients, I would argue. So you kind of have this one shot on goal, even with these combination regimens. So I think that's important. What am I thinking about for this particular case? One is where are the sites of disease that are progressing? And if it's just one or two spots, many of us are reaching for this 
spot welder technique where we call a radiation oncologist, we radiate, we keep them on the same systemic therapy. This does not appear to be the case for this patient, right? They've got multiple sites of disease progression. I'm absolutely pushing for reprofiling. I would ideally like to make sure that we have enough tissue to understand the histology, that there's no histology transformation. That's really important because you see it. It's not the most common cause of why you develop acquired mechanisms or resistance, but it does happen. Sure. You don't want to miss it. So I think that's important. I would also advocate that we get another brain MRI at this time too, just to make sure we're not missing intracranial disease progression. If you find an acquired mechanism of resistance that you can target, that's actionable, go for it. If you don't, which is probably more likely, what do you do in this setting? A few options. One thing I'd want to know is for this patient that started on Flora 2 and they've been on maintenance Pemetrexid, how long has it been since they last got platinum-based chemotherapy? The update that we got from World Lung with Flora 2 and overall survival, what they showed us was that for the majority of patients that got a first subsequent line of therapy, it was most commonly platinum-based chemo. So get the opportunity to pull platinum chemo back in, especially if it's right. been a prolonged amount of time, the patient has tolerated it well, their counts look good. You can consider doing that. With amivantamab, it's sort right. of like so Amaraposa 2 with a twist based on the fact that this patient got upfront combination therapy. I think that's a good strategy. The other approval that we have is Dato DXD, which is an antibody drug conjugate. That's a new kid on the block, if you will, for EGFR positive disease. And that comes from data from Tropion Lungo 1, Tropion Lungo 5 pool data. And it just got approved in June of 2025. We saw an objective response rate of 45% in the third line, which is quite impressive for patients and duration of the response greater than 6.5 months. So I'm thinking about that, but in this patient, she sounds like she has multiple COPD exacerbations. As you know, one of the potential side effects with an ADC like Dato DXD can be ILD or pneumonitis happens in probably less than 10% of patients, but when it happens, it happens, right? I'm thinking about that too. And if I need to talk to my pulmonary medicine colleagues to guide, manage, things like that. Eric, I want to reiterate to what you stated. Though this is not a common scenario, but important is to repeat biopsy and recheck for that NGS panel, that there is a small chance of small cell conversion or other aspect is growth of that existing small cell clone at the time of progression. Now, going back to our platinum story, as you're stating, if there was a disease progression, now, does it matter of reintroducing of platinum if this progression of the disease is at four months versus eight months. Yeah. So you're asking a really tough question, Rohit. I think, you know, that magical number, is it three months? Is it six months? We think right. about that in small cell lung cancer. Non-small cell lung cancer, should we be thinking that way? Should we not? I will tell you my clinical practice and in the clinical practice of others, when we've unpacked really challenging EGFR cases, a lot of people do think like that. Like if our patient can tolerate it, it's been maybe six months or more, right. it's reasonable to re-challenge and try another course of platinum therapy. You don't want the patient to miss out on the imivantamab because it's a very novel way of treating this disease. Imivantamab can give you that benefit of going after EGFR and MET. There's also that potential immunotherapy type of component that's embedded within imivantamab and the potential for more durable, really more profound responses. You don't want to miss that opportunity. And I think it's more about partnering it with a particular agent. So if you can pull platinum therapy, partner with imivantamab, it's very reasonable. What makes it cleaner in terms of what you can introduce is Dato DXD by the sequencing. That's a nice addition or strategy that we have for patients in terms of sequencing. Absolutely. Can I reiterate one thing? We were doing this even when we were talking about that small cell lung cancer, and Eric, you touched here, that subsequent therapy is not often seen. We see this in clinical trials, and you brought this up as well. Likely, that number is significantly higher in the real world. Something to keep in mind. Use your best treatment upfront. Eric, going back to that first case, as we're talking about our treatment options, does the resistant pattern look any different if we use amylaz upfront versus chemo RC? Given we've not used chemotherapy upfront with Mariposa data, is it fair to say that a lot of us will rely on this and then reach out to Dato DXC at the time of progression? First, we're always trying to think about the benefit that patients are getting up front. But as oncologists, we always have plan B, C, and D ready, or we should. One of the things we're thinking about to guide that next plan is acquired mechanisms of resistance. I appreciate the work that was done in the Mariposa study where they looked to see what are the more common acquired mechanisms of resistance if patients get, let's say, amylaz up front. What they saw was that if patients got amylaz up front, there was a decrease in acquired MET amplifications. There was also a decrease 
and several secondary EGFR resistance mutations like C797S, which is impactful and meaningful. But let's say a patient does experience disease progression on amylase. What are you thinking about? I'm definitely thinking about platinum-based chemotherapy. I think that's really important in terms of the strategy. It's, it's hard for me to think about letting go of that EGFR inhibition though, and going to just platinum therapy. We got some data with osramertinib from the COMPEL study at World Lung, where patients, yep. if they had non-CNS disease progression and they were on single agent OC, were randomized to either get platinum-based chemotherapy plus placebo or continued the OC as a backbone. And you saw there was an improvement in progression-free survival. There was an improvement trending towards overall survival. And not only that, and very meaningful was the brain was better protected. There was less CNS disease development for patients that stayed on OC and had that backbone. For me, I would find a way, we're talking off label, we're thinking about our patients, we're Absolutely. trying to make best interest, but I would find a way to think about keeping that EGFR ambition intact. Of course, you also have data DXD2 in the setting, so you can pull that. Multiple treatment options, and there are a lot of nuances here. Keeping the patients at the center of all this is important, as clearly what we can see from the conversation itself, one size does not fit all. Eric, thank you so much for taking the time to walk us through this complex and evolving treatment landscape for our EGFR positive metastatic non-small cell lung cancer patient population. For our listeners, let us go over a quick recap. In today's challenging case discussion with Dr. Eric Senge from MD Anderson, we had a chance to touch on the available treatment options and the data in hand that can guide these decisions. Flora2, which is also mertinib with chemotherapy, recently reported a median overall survival of 47.5 months, which is amazing. But for Mariposa, roughly at 42 months, the median overall survival has not reached. That is very, very exciting because that means majority of the patients were still living and likely will see overall survival that could exceed four years. Rahul, outside of these median overall survival benefit, we have to keep side effects and how these medications are delivered in mind. For Mariposa, keeping cocoon data, which to prevent VTEs and skin rash and skip IRR for infusion reaction is critical. Whereas for Flora2, you have to keep the side effects of chemotherapy in mind. We hope you're enjoying these new initiatives such as challenging cases and talks check discussions while we also continue with our conference highlights and treatment algorithm series. Thanks for joining us. We are the Oncology Brothers.